Welcome to the Virtualization Security Video Podcast, episode number three, but we're now at 158, I believe, of the, the non-video podcast series. With me, joining me today is Mike Foley of VMware Technical Marketing, where he works on vSphere security. And Tom Howarth, who is a virtualization analyst with a virtualization, virtualization practice, where he does data center, cloud, you name it. He does pretty much everything. Welcome both. Howdy. Howdy. I thought I'd be American today. <laughs> Texan. <laughs> Howdy. Howdy, y'all. <laughs> Yeehaw. <laughs> today I want to talk about something a little bit different, specifically about how do we, as security professionals, and Tom, I know you're not a security professional per se, but you've dealt with it, and you went to, a, you didn't you sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night? I slept somewhere interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Out in the doghouse. <laughs> I'm a good boy. The I want to change. I think we need to change how security looks at people within inside the organization. And by that I mean, instead of saying, "Hey, I'm going to block people from doing something," allowing them for once would be nice but also changing how they educate the users instead of trying to say educate the users and the people about you know security of the organization but change that focus a little bit to be the security of the people now let's think about this one we can always say security needs to meet the needs of the business right yes oh yes obviously that's an easy statement but people make up the business and if you can't meet the needs of the people, the employees, how can you meet the needs of the business? Well, the needs of the people are the needs of the business. But are they? I would say, yeah, on 99.9% .9 of the time, if security, a position of security means that a person can't do their job to the best of their abilities, then they're not meeting the needs of the business. Okay, but let's they're think about... They're being obstructive. Well, one of the major security tenants is classify your data. We've been telling people that for years. People don't know what that means. They have no idea what classify your data means unless you're working at an organization where if you don't, you go to jail. Again, it became real personal real quickly. Well, I think one of the... The, the biggest issues, uh, before we start talking about f trying to figure a way to fix it or address it, is let's talk about the reality. Right now, in many companies, certainly not all, but in many companies, the security guy is seen as an outsider. He's seen as someone who always says no. Uh, he seems as not aligned with the business needs in, in some cases. And he seems as someone who's confrontational. Correct. I would agree with right? you. And uh, when you add yeah. all when you add all of that up, who the hell wants to deal with that kind of person? Well, not only that, in virtual and cloud environments, the security guy's been marginalized for so long because he kept on saying, No, you can't do that. And the yeah. business is going, I'm saving buckets of cash. Of course I'm going to do it. Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing this. Um, I'm seeing this myself, where, and you probably saw it in my session last year, where you know, 500 people in the room are IT people who are being badgered by their security people to make things better, and like five or ten people in the room are security people. Yeah, and it's because all of this stuff happened outside of the purview or even control of the security person. So now the security person has to deal with it. So in defense of the security person, stuff's happening and they're not finding out until they're told to then secure it. Oh, by the way, everything's in production, right? Well, the case in point, I had, a, I had a customer way back when, when I was a consultant for HP, I did a little bit of consulting um, one-week engagements here and there, which was great. 
I got to meet a lot of people. I was brought in to help them put a virtual environment, actually several virtual environments, in for various projects that literally could not talk to each other. It's like, okay, that's doable. You need different environments and so forth. At that time, there was no real good multi-tenancy and things sure. like that. But the security guy was invited in on that conversation. He shows up, listens to the pitch, and he says, but there's no air gap, and walks out. Yeah. It's like, okay, instead of actually learning about the technology, he's basically said, does it meet my current needs and leaves? Yet that technology was used. So he was invited in and, and then got marginal to refused to participate and got marginalized. And now, he has, years later, he's, the, that same guy was struggling to catch up. Yeah. I mean, Security people do it to themselves. Over in the UK, we have this concept called a class consultant. Basically, every government project has to have a class consultant who deals with the overall security of the environment and the what the project is going to deliver. Now, it's common practice to tell the class consultant what's going to happen. He comes back and says, well, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. But he's working from a position that is sometimes five, ten years out of date and hasn't up to date with the technology. You know, and it's not his it's it's not his problem per se because he hasn't he doesn't see that as his purview. His purview is to follow this set of rules and this set of rules says that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. I mean we've had the we've had the issues with especially in the some of the environments that I've worked with over the last 10, 15 years of of air gaps. And oh, yes. Yeah. Air gaps is one of the most ridiculous situations in the whole world, to be perfectly honest, because there is no such thing as an air gap. Yeah. Every, I remember you know, one guy no saying, how everything far you is, go, everything's air gapped. It goes in this box and out that box. And I said, you do realize that box is running probably like a... 2.6 version Linux kernel from 1998, right? And the look on their face is like, uh, uh, no, it's an appliance. <laughs> no, it's a box running IP tables with a fancy interface. Yeah, there is no think... air gap. That's right. It's all hackable. And so what I would like to do is I'd like to see the security guy sit down and learn if they haven't already, and if they have, that's great. I wanted to put the no, the K N O W in innovation. I think we've lost Mike. No, I'm still here. Mike just stops talking. Oh, I've lost Mike. <laughs> You've lost Mike. <laughs> I can see you all. It's a security issue for you. <laughs> um, but if we put the knowledge back into security, but how are they going to do that? That's the key. We, Mike, you and I, we spend days, if not months, just educating people constantly. Right. And it's the same old thing. There's nothing new here. I spent, the, I, I was at the Cloud Security World delivering a, a conference, and we started, okay, ask them, list all the things that they don't like about cloud from a security perspective. And so they did that, and I said, is there anything new here? No. No. It's like, okay, you need to deal with this. That's no different in the cloud than the physical world. Okay, now the second half of the Virtualization Security Podcast, episode number three, video podcast, that is. And we were talking about how to change security's way of educating the users or the way they look at things. And I think let's talk a little bit about the educating of the users. Um, most companies have security awareness programs that they're – required to by compliance or policy to give to each of their employees. Mm -hmm. And I know I went through a few where it's basically you get a quiz, you get you get a slide deck, 15 slides, and then you take a quiz. And if I remembered anything from that two days later, I'd be very surprised. Right. I mean, it's, it's almost this, it's almost the same days. as the, the courses you have to take uh, around diversity. Exactly. In ethics. In ethics. But the parent, the 
courses I took around parenting and how to protect my foster kids is very, very different than anything else. Okay. Right? It's about real, like, you got to look at things very, very differently because it's about protecting yourself as well as protecting them. All foster parents go through this training. And if they if they re- forget it, they're in really serious trouble. Yeah, it sounds very similar to the training I took uh, the other week for, um, you know, adult members of a Boy Scout troop. Exactly. Where you have to take this this training around too deep leadership so that there should only there should never be a, an adult and a child alone. Exactly. Exactly. Right? And I actually so I took that course and and we're at a troop meeting at the school in the gym. And I noticed one of the dads going off to talk to some of the scouts that are in the cafeteria. And I'm like, I got to go. Got to go make sure he doesn't get in trouble or any of us get in trouble. Exactly. Come to find out, we get in the cafeteria and there's one adult a father of one of the kids just hanging out. It's like, well, you can't do that. So, yeah, it's it sticks with you for a while. But unless you're, I think, unless you're almost immediately exposed to it after learning it, it just goes gone. And I think that's probably the failure of some of these security courses where everyone has to sit down and talk about everyone needs a 12 character mixed case, upper, you know, diddly doola password sort of thing. It, it, It holds no real value in the real world. But turning around and explaining, look, if you get an Excel spreadsheet from someone who you're not quite sure who they are, you probably don't want to open it. You probably want to call them up and ask them. That might be something that might stick with someone. Well, but it's you... a little more real world because they can go, oh, yeah, I get Excel spreadsheets from all sorts of people. Yep. When, and, and not only that, if you think about it from this perspective, it's like, okay, you do online banking. Everybody does. I, I don't know a single person does on, doesn't do online banking, right? right? You get an Excel spreadsheet, and it extracts all, as, extracts all your credentials. Go, John, Tom? I don't do online banking. Well, good for really? you. No. Why? I do. Why? Yeah. Never mind. That's a different. You don't trust it? No. That's your fault, Ed. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, it's my fault because I don't trust much. But if you do do online banking and you receive an online a spreadsheet from somebody that has enough malware in there to actually extract the credentials you use to log into your bank account, and this is not an if, this is a when. This happens all the time. They can actually get the credentials, log in, and suck all the money out of your account. Now, if you're smart, you'll get notified that a transaction happened, but a lot of people don't set up that notification. Yeah. And it's really, if I can tell you how to protect your environment just by setting up a little notification, and protect your family funds, that account you used to buy the Christmas gifts, that account you used to do the grocery store or whatever it is, you're touching it every day. If I can teach you to do a little bit of notification to say, hey, if there was a transaction, at least verify it was your transaction. Like I got three that just came in. One was from Belgium. It's like I haven't been to Belgium. Another one was like, oh, okay, that was Apple. Okay, I did buy something from Apple recently. And I'll be wearing it soon. But when you start thinking about those transactions, you need to know what they are. And that way, I looked at the Belgian one and go, okay, i got to look something up. So I looked it up. It's like, of course, ah, I do do business with a company in Belgium. It was a recurring charge that I completely and utterly forgot about. But you've got to be willing to look up and go further than just saying, I'm going to be sitting there not getting notified or ignore those messages that come on your device. So I guess this brings up the point of, there's always going to be people who, A, will just take the course just because they're told they have to. Yep. People who take the course and kind of sort of get it, but then it just goes poof out of the head. 
And I think out of all of the people who take the course, a single digit percentage will totally get what you're talking about. And you know what? That's a better than having a zero percentage. The where yeah, it is today. You're, yeah, but your your weakest link is, you know, the 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 guy who has an account who just shares his password with anybody or 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 what have you, you know. Or Mabel, who writes a password down and hides it underneath her laptop because she can't remember it because it's too complicated. And that's why I use passphrases, and that present, prevents me from putting something under my keyboard. Indeed. But, no, that, then, that, that, the then says, is, that then says, you know, the security guy has an onus in understanding that, okay, we everyone took the course. Yay, we're compliant. But that doesn't mean his job is done. It means now he has to turn around and do a better job of isolating the vast majority of those people for whom taking the course was, oh, okay. A checkbox. But yeah. the thing is, we've got to get out of that checkbox mentality. And if we can educate the people of the business how to protect themselves and their family, it becomes much more... Just like these classes you and I took, and Tom have took, on you know all this stuff, it's something that is there to protect your family. It it does it does it translates better. It does provide some level of putting the company in a better place because you have more people that might be aware. But. I really think the onus has to be on the IT and the security people to come up with better ways to isolate um, positions that that uh, have very limited needs. I mean, we'll just, I don't want to pick on the guys in the shipping department, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the... The guys in the shipping department who the shipping clerks, the shipping clerks who don't necessarily need anything more than a web browser and a an email client and access to their shipping application shouldn't be anywhere near capable of being the attack vector into the company. Well, I, I get that, and that needs to be done as well. But I'm sorry, I think it's really on the burdens on the people as well as the security team. It's not, this is not a, a one side, one side all security is not the one that has to be responsible for all this. Just like during world war II, loose lips sink ships. The people were involved. This is the way it is today. If you're not involved with the security of your organization or the security of your family, you're not involved. It does not mean that you're not responsible. Right. You are still responsible. That whole attitude of don't talk about things that you shouldn't, the Official Secrets Act or whatever you want to do, all this yep. stuff has – I mean, the thing is we don't give it teeth. I know companies where policy no. is, is if you talk about company project XYZ, you will lose your job. It's written right in the documentation. People there's, talk about project there's – there's, there's a company that sells fruit on the West Coast that is very much like that. Yeah. yeah. But people do it all the time, and they don't, like, follow through. That should be dope. But the people are responsible for their own actions. That's what I'm getting at. If I let someone view my iPhone while I'm typing in my password and they can see the characters, that's my problem. Security well, can't do anything about that. Let, let's be quite clear, and, and you can you can have different, a different opinion than what I'm about to spout, is the courses that you're required to take – Part of those, yes, it's to help educate people. The other, the vast majority of the reason for those courses is one, compliance yes. objectives, two, legal liability indemnification from something bad happening. Well, you know, we taught all of our court, all of our people, we are compliant, therefore you can't sue us, Mr. Customer. And actually, Mr. Customer can sue you because it actually didn't take. Yes, but the damages, the damages will probably be much less because the company can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, based on numbers, 
that it did its best effort to limit the the problem from the employee standpoint. It, it, the, the, it, I agree with you. I just this, don't. This, this, I this agree whole, with you, whole, but I don't think it's right. This issue of security and compliance and everything else is far more, and, and I think you'll agree with me, is far more than just slap AV and a firewall and say you're done. It's the the ramifications of doing it wrong are huge to the business, uh, potentially huge to your customers, and while you're not going well, to I'm gonna, be I'm gonna say 100%. One, I'm going to say one thing. It's actually potentially huge to your employees. Yes, yeah, and, and your employees, right. You know, you could turn around and have a whole bunch of personally identifiable information that gets compromised. Do you also uh, you could be – you could be um, out of business because of whatever it is, and the employees will end up having to find new jobs. I'm not talking about PII about your employees. I'm talking about, you know, this is sometimes it's a seriously, a serious enough impact that the company doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. What was the name of that company that that had their Amazon uh, control Code panel? Spa Code Spaces. Code Space. But they're actually yeah. a, they were a fairly small company comparatively speaking. But yeah, I'm but it, about, it, it's it's a perfect example of yeah. look here's X number of people that have lost their livelihood. Yes. This is you know, and this for those people just, listening on the podcast, Code Space was a was a startup that had everything up running up in Amazon and uh, including their backups and they their control panel that allowed the creation and deletion of VMs and management of backups. Uh, the credentials were stolen and the uh, perpetrators removed all the uh, other accounts and kept their own management account and then held it for ransom. When the company called their bluff and said, well, we're not going to pay, the perpetrators deleted every single bit of content that was stored up in Amazon, including all their IP, all their backups, all their virtual machines, essentially with one click of a mouse button, deleted a company. And the company is no longer available. It's completely 100% out of business. Right. And I'll, I'll tell you one thing. Could the security people for Code Spaces have fixed this problem? Absolutely. All they needed sure. was an off-site backup that was a true off-site backup and two-factor authentication. But you and I have been through all that. Yeah. And But that's a perfectly perfect example. But I'm, I'm actually thinking about broader. I mean, if you think about bigger companies, that was a fairly – it was a startup. But if sure. you think about bigger companies, you get fined three, four $400 million because you didn't meet compliance. The people that did, did not meet compliance, that whole team is gone. Right. And, you know, and so – I think we spend an awful lot of time over the past couple of years uh, kind of giving out to the security people, right? It's it, They're the easy foil. Yeah. But they do have a lot of challenges. Absolutely. And a, a lot of the challenges are driven by compliance. And I think what's happening is, is um, they're, through possibly no fault of their own, taking their eyes off the ball of where they could be spending more time in securing the company versus maintaining the appropriate compliance level. There should be the a com I go, go on, Tom. One of the problems I have with security blokes is they obsess about the bind you take without looking at the big picture. Yep. And that's the key. I think the big picture here is who makes up the business people educate the people in a way that they'll actually remember what you're talking about and actually apply it in some fashion. Even if they only remember, hey, don't, I shouldn't be using Wi-Fi in a, in a coffee shop to access the corporate network or access my bank. Oops, I should probably not do that for my corporate network. That's fine too. You've learned something. And every time they go through the training, they learn something more and more and more. This is not something where you just do it once and forget. This is an ongoing, continual Train your people. I mean, we as security professionals, and the reason why I was thinking about this, we as security professionals do certain things all the time. We have our own best practices. For example, do I use a lot of cloud resources? 
No. Do I have all my data on iCloud? No. Should I? I could. It makes no difference to me. But what really makes a difference is can I protect it myself? Yeah. But now I've trained my I've trained my family to also look at this stuff askew. It took me years to say don't click on anything you see. But after saying it so many times and proving like in dealing with the virus and imp- the impact onto a machine, people get the point. Don't click on it because they lose their machine. They can't do their work. They can't do their day-to-day whatever they need. They're out of the picture, and eventually they learn, okay, I don't click on things. But it yeah. takes and, constant and education. Go ahead, Tom. After uh, having my 11-year-old son rebuild his his workstation six or seven times, he's finally figured out that you don't just go willy-nilly installing anything from the Internet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes pain works. <laughs> we've all been through it, but we all go, oh, that's just the fact that we have to do business this way. It's like, no, learn from your mistakes and go on. Well, uh, so that brings up a really great point. I've been, um, I've been getting lots of uh, emails and inquiries and concerns and panic me- messages from people uh, about you know the whole VM escape situation, right? And this is another case of education. Yes. Right. Yeah, because there's and been so many reported real live cases of VM escape. True VM escape. Show me. Exactly. Right. Yet. Um, it, it, it seems to be like the number one priority on the mind of various folks out there. And this goes back to not only education of the users, but it really starts to, you really start to wonder about education of the security teams. Yes. Uh, their, their knowledge of the technology is, yeah. in my opinion, really starting to scare me. And that's the nice thing. When I was at Cloud Security World, I taught an eight, um, a one-day class seminar at uh, the beginning of it for – it was on cloud security and hybrid, hybrid cloud security, actually. And one of the things we all talked about was the VM escape and all that. And what, what, it was surprising who I had in the room. I had only two people that were truly security folks, or everybody else was either compliance or auditing. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I'm glad the compliance folks and the auditing folks are in there, but where are the security folks? They need to be in there. Right. But if I can get educate them to say, hey, you know what? This stuff is not as scary as you think. You know, compliance in the cloud is you do it differently, yet you do the same thing. Mm. You just got to yeah. find how to extend your compliance and auditing procedures and even your security procedures into the cloud. And people haven't even thought of that. That's the scary part to me. It's like we're using Salesforce. We're using Dropbox or Box. We're using XYZ. I mean, there's companies using 2,000-odd cloud services, and they don't even know how to even – they're think, still thinking old school. I've got to put a perimeter around this. It's like there is no perimeter. You get anything out of this class, there is no perimeter. Right. Don't even think about it. The perimeter has to be around your – the way you handle the data, the way you – tie the users to that data, that's yeah, where the am, perimeters what, end up being. What, what amazes me is how people um, continue to want to do things the way they've always done it, yet the attack vectors and the bad guys are the ones that are doing the innovation in security. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's all that's, sorts of... Well, that's I can go right, been the case. But I can go right now, if I knew the right people... Order up, you know, rent a botnet from somebody, buy a buy a, a set of machines from another, you know, buy a attack vector from a third, you know, put it all together with my own little magic, and I now have a network that I can use to promote malware or whatever I want. This is known, and people have been doing this for years. They've already gone to microservices. They've already gone to containerization. Right. We're still struggling yeah. with this from a security perspective, but the bad guys are already there. Yes. We Scary. have to learn from them. So I guess um, 
we're probably I got to get moving soon. But so why don't we wrap this up? But let me ask a question of the two of you. Have you seen the pilot for this new TV show called Mr. Robot? No, I have not. OK, maybe that's a good question. Maybe it's a good question. I've never even heard time. of it. It must be an American thing. It yeah, is. it's coming out on USA Network. So, yes, it's very American. Um, but <laughs> it is it is up on YouTube and it's up on iTunes. Uh, the first episode is free. Oh, I remember um, reading. I saw the previews for this. This is pretty it interesting. It is essential. It, it, I watched it last night with my wife and we both can't wait for the next episode. It um, it. It's about a very brilliant young man who is a security researcher for a security, cybersecurity firm who gets approached to hack um, the company his company is protecting and to um, change the way things are done. You could almost say he's kind of Snowden-ish, uh, but, but, but not because Snowden had a different agenda. But uh, the, the agendas are similar, but the methods are, are different. And he is a geek. And, you know, there's mention of, uh, uh, you know, the KDE desktop. There's lots of Linuxy looking consoles. What I did find very interesting was that they were using commands at the Linux console that were not Linux commands. So I paused it for a second. I'm like, T T S U or T something S U. And I'm like, what the hell is it? ATSU. I look up ATSU, and there's a link to something saying they made up Linux commands so that you know it wouldn't come off as being as everyone groaning, going, "Oh, you don't use that to do that," you know. Uh, but it was it was smart. It was really smart, uh, and I really enjoyed it. I think it'll foster more conversation around this whole dark world of bad actors and and how susceptible you are and and what i found really interesting was is the show was not afraid to go places i didn't think it would it even called out companies like apple and other companies for less less than good practices okay well, on that note, everybody should take a look at that on YouTube. Think about how you would educate the user, your people of your business, the people that make up your business to protect themselves, and hopefully that will protect the business, especially if you do it the right way. It should. And think about how, as security professionals, you can get the training you need to do your jobs better. Yep. And remember, compliance does not mean security. And security does not mean compliance, but... Boy, you need both. Yep. All yep. right, Tom, Mike, thank you very much. Thank you.